Okay, hello, hello. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Flying Cat Marketing Interview Series. Today, I have Stefan Hedebrandt uh, from Dream Data, which is an attribution software to help us understand the ROI of marketing efforts that you do, basically. And today, we're going to talk about how to see ROI from content and SEO. Welcome, Stefan. How's it going? <laughs> Thank you so much, Mayra. Uh, it's going pretty good. Uh, summer's approaching and uh, I'm getting a kid soon, as I just told you before. So yeah, I'm really trying Two to weeks. wrap up the, the work task uh, as soon as <laughs> I can. <laughs> so are you working super long days to try to get everything done? No, I'm not. It's, you know, it's also summer, so yeah. things are a little bit more slow than uh, than usually. But yeah. you know, I just want to get that one extra task in there before yes. I have to, <laughs> to, have to be out. How do how do you feel about your team taking over for you while you're away? <laughs> um, pretty good, but uh, it's, you know, it's always ah, oh, there's this detail that yeah, I would have done different, and uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. just you know, it's you know, you're always engaged as a you know, uh, a partner of the company that you want to get the best out of every situation, and but it's also you know, sometimes you need to step away and not try to micro manage everything. Exactly. Yeah. You step away and then you quickly find out what was broken that you could actually fix so that next time, you, you know, you just make your team more independent each time. Yeah. And like, if you were to think about like, like leadership, if people are not behaving the way you want them to do when you're away, maybe it's because you didn't uh, set everything up in the right place uh, while you were there. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, good luck on your <laughs> second, second child. I hope everything yeah, goes amazingly. You. Hope you get a little bit of sleep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll just drink more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about seeing ROI from content. I think this is such an important topic, one that's really important to me as well. Yeah. Uh, and also attribution is such a hot, hot topic. There's people saying you can't really attribute because <laughs> it's dark social um yeah, yeah. but yes you actually should attribute so so what's actually let's start with uh, what's your take on attribution how closely do you need to follow this software like how accurate can attribution at the end of the day be yeah <laughs> that's a lot of uh, a lot of good questions maybe um where to start so first of all i'm a, a big fan of content production because I, I like I fundamentally believe that your website should basically exhaust any questions that anybody might have related to your business yeah. because like why would you want to get an answer behind a salesperson if you can just make it available for people on the website so when they come to you they're much more educated and mature in their thinking around your product so first of all very much uh, a, a proponent for making a lot of content then uh, secondly, I would say uh, challenges I've faced myself uh, in the past have been to, you know, set up big content production uh, teams or like hire a lot of people to, to produce content. And there the question, can, or the challenges sometimes comes from the organization when, uh, when you have no proof besides, you know, organic traffic going up and, you know, vanity stuff like uh, href ranks or something like that has improved that it can be a little bit hard to defend to the cfo to the you know the ceo yeah. or whoever you report to that it's uh, we need to keep doing this uh like in my last company before here i, I set up from one year to the next i, I got a headcount of uh, four people to you know just produce content and I could show the organization, hey, look at our rankings, look at our, you know, Google and organic search it went up, but yeah, but how much revenue comes out of this? And yeah. then you start to think about, ah, okay, what can I do to, to show that it's valuable? And I think, first of all, it's impossible to like, you know, one-to-one -one describe the value uh, of content uh, because it, you know, it's so it's you know you don't track everything and you don't you cannot cover that people email a link to each other or like send a, a mail on a send a, a link on slack etc but it is actually quite possible uh, to track certain parts of content production and i think 
let's just address this kind of uh, <laughs> you see on LinkedIn almost like nowadays attribution software has become kind of the the evil uh, stuff that doesn't work and uh, for us like it's, it's not at all weird what we're trying to do uh, so we're just trying to be 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 your go-to-market data platform and what what that means is that we want to take any digital touch that you have available and present that to you in a like an easy understandable form so whether it's a meeting that an AE had or whether it's a mail that was sent through an automation system or a visit to a piece of content on the website we just want to line all of it up on a timeline and show you this is the data you do have available so it's, there's no there's no magic at all it's your own first party yeah. connected data this is the timeline and the problem right now that we are trying to, to solve for is that all of this is, is stuck in silos and you have no clue what's going on. Yeah. Then you can, when you do have all that, all those touches lined up, it's interesting to start looking at what pieces of content do people organically Google for and then end up becoming either a sales pipeline or maybe at best, uh, you know, deals that you win. Mm -hmm. And then there are certain articles that uh, consistently show up or like URLs that people read and then go on to become sales pipeline. Now we're not saying that we're capturing a hundred percent of those visits and connected to revenue, but at least this is the, uh, statistical proof we have available yeah. for you, which should instruct you. It's probably a good idea to make more of this type of content and this type of content rarely becomes a sales pipeline. So let's not spend our resources producing those. Yeah. Do you think, so I've found some, um, I don't want to say backlash, but just, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just some push that when I'm trying to talk about attribution to clients, they want to see everything in Salesforce. So they want mm. everything to work and they want to be able to look at Salesforce <laughs> and grab reports from that and just fully understand everything in there. What's the difference between the kind of attribution that comes from, you know, marketing automation that plugs into Salesforce and something like an actual attribution software? Yeah, and then like, yeah, again, let's, uh, so the CRM system, they typically have this, uh, this uh, original source challenge because the CRM systems only track when you have a conversion. So that means that, you know, at least for us, when we have a demo call booked, there's four sessions. The first session would typically be like a click on an ad or like some organic search or a referral from somewhere. Then the next time it would be maybe an organic Google where they just hit the front page because they Googled the brand. Yeah. And then the third and the fourth visit would be now the, the your URL sticks in the browser to so just like start typing and then hit enter and yeah. then come to your website. If they convert on the fourth visit inside the CRM system, they'll tell you this was a direct visit. And then all the efforts you put into actually producing that journey is not regarded at all. Okay. So that means, you know, it will say in the original source in the CRM, in the Salesforce, it will say direct. So you see all the activities and costs you had associated to actually producing that visit is not regarded. And that's when marketing starts to be, you know, regarded as, you know, just a cost and not okay. something that actually starts a journey. I mean, uh, if you look at, uh, we put out some benchmarks a month ago or something like that, where we can see that the average account for us took, uh, from all our customers, took 192 days from the first visit from the account to the deal was closed. So it's very long journeys that people need to go through and, and, and the deals do not come out of nowhere. So you need to produce a lot of relevant content that can bring people to your website that can initiate these journeys. And then with luck and skill, those visits then becomes yeah. MQLs, SQLs and, and pipeline you win. How was this? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, uh, that helps a lot understand and also helps me build a business case <laughs> for why. <laughs> Salesforce is not clear enough. And actually they're like so dead set on finding a way to get it all from Salesforce, but it doesn't actually paint a clear picture. Yeah. Well, what we sometimes help clients do is that we, you know, in, in dream data, we make the data available in a data warehouse for you. And then you can use what's called a reverse ETL tool 
which is just, or some call it like last mile data. So you say, okay, from the dream data data warehouse, let's put a field underneath the original source field that says which uh, source do you, does dream data say it comes from. So you can actually, you can, you can put the data back into the CRM system and get a more uh, nuanced uh, uh, approach to it. Can you walk me through, so I understand the difference between first touch and last touch. Can you walk me through the different other attributions? There's linear, there's W, there's some yeah. other one. Uh... I think the, actually the most important thing to say uh, initially is that all of the models are gonna be wrong if it's you know built on a data set that is 5% of the complete journey. <laughs> so, Anyway, like any model you'd apply, just if you only have like 5% of the journey available, it's going to be wrong. So that is why for all these uh, vendors out there, the most important thing is that they're able to actually handle all the touches that touch your accounts. And that okay. is across three, four, five stakeholders, 192 days, 30 sessions, etc. You know, you want to have all those touches into the timeline. And when you do have the timeline of these touches, that's when you start applying the, the attribution model. So as you said, obviously the first touch model is a, a model where you give 100% of, let's say you had a deal of $10,000, then you say it was the very first touch that brought in all those, um, those $10,000. That's probably not true. The way I use these uh, single touch models is that I, I use them to exaggerate certain things so I'm, I'm as a, a B2B marketing leader, I'm interested in understanding how can I start more journeys that ends up becoming the sales qualified pipeline. Okay. And, and the very first touch for me is typically the most important touch because that tells us something about where did we start the journeys. But yeah, so the, the standard rule-based models are kind of first touch, last touch or linear and linear then distributes the revenue evenly. So if there's 10 touches and you have $10,000, then you say each touch is $1,000 worth. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, because it's kind of hard to say which one made the most impact, right? Yeah, and you know, at the end of the day, you're still guessing. And <laughs> it's just a model you apply. But I think the, the, the way to go about it is to, you know, look, you know, switch between the different models to, you know, look at the truth from uh, different perspectives before you make up an opinion about what's true and what and what's not true. It also depends, like, in the use cases. So if I'm looking to understand which, which activities start journeys, then I do like a first touch model or maybe what's called a W shape model. <laughs> if I'm looking to just say, what are the things that move the ball across the line that maybe it's a last touch model. So you should yeah. need to think about which model and what are, is the use case that you're trying to, to go for. Can, do people do hybrid models? Like they look at one and, and the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you should look, you should do all of the models at, at all times. You know, also if okay. you think about, if you think about content, you might do some, I'm sure you do that already, but you might do some, content where you do it for what you would call top funnel or branding yeah. where you, you take a very broad keyword and try to rank that. That keyword is never ever gonna look good in a less touch model <laughs> because right. it's it's far away from you know the actual intent or purchase. You're just doing it to get your brand out there. So to understand, let's say that top funnel uh, article, you would wanna do like a, a model that appreciates the first part of the journey. Whereas if you do your, uh, buy a consultancy service now <laughs> that probably looks pretty in a in a last touch model because the intent behind the search is closely related to a yeah. conversion makes sense so you have done uh, you've learned a lot using your own tool on your own company yeah um so if we're talking content what are the the biggest thing discoveries that you've made okay Two or three things. Uh, so I think the, my general learning is that there's two buckets of content. There's content that drives traffic to your website. And then there's content people look at as they're buying your product. And if we start with the articles you write for Google, where you're trying to get people to your website, 
the content that has the highest intent of, you know, actually making a buying decision about your product are the ones you should spend time on. So that be your like vendor or software, et cetera, yeah. joined with your category, or, you know, you can also produce these alternative articles where you list my, if there's an established player in the business, this company does this, we do this, this is how we compare. So, yeah. so this is very low funnel, high intent. Whereas I often see the very broad articles where you go for a really large keyword, uh, if not a waste of time, then at least very hard to prove the value okay. of. <laughs> yeah. So always write for the intention. Uh, a flavor to that has been that as we started out, what directed most of our content production was the feedback the salespeople would be coming to us uh, with. The questions that they would be getting asked during sales conversations, let's just write an, a good answer to all those questions. Because you cannot like demand of your salespeople to know complex technology, all marketing tactics, et cetera, et cetera. Let's have good answers for that on our blog instead. Because then the salespeople mm -hmm. just need to know there is a blog post and he can say, we have a good answer to that, I'll send you that later. So with salespeople actually dictated our content production for a long time. Oh, really? Okay. So that, but that's not always distributable for, via search. There's no. And the, so you have and to make sure then, they're actually going to use it. Yeah, that's true. And uh, my thinking behind it was that like we're in an industry where people get marketing and where they get SEO. So I'm not going to base our business on like being able to drive enough uh, organic traffic because, you know, the competitors know about link building, they know about, you know, writing long form, et cetera. So let's start out by just helping the salespeople get going with content. Okay. And then that, that can maybe lead me to moving over to the other bucket of content, which is what do people look at when they buy? And maybe just to do an intro of what, why I'm saying this uh, is that with Dream Data, we track every single session and every URL that any user looks at. And that we also have available on a, a company level. So. We can say when a, an account is closed one, we can go back and look at all the URLs that was looked at at all. Okay. And, there, and then there's typically a mismatch between the URLs that they enter from and the ones that you actually look at when you buy. And I can give you a couple of uh, anecdotes of what's important for our website. Yeah, our, our, our about page is important. You know, that's kind of a page you just like look at once a year, but actually when you're making a buying decision, you actually want to validate, can I trust these guys? Uh, our integration page is super important, makes sense, but it's also a page you kind of, you know, let's just write some names here and then move on. And then we also saw our community page, which is just a small link that leads to our Slack channel, was typically quite present as well, which we never ever thought about. But it's when you start looking at the URLs that accounts that buy look at, then it's different from where they they enter. Yeah. And then the last, the funny one is the the 404 page. <laughs> if you do trigger that one, it's actually quite likely that you're in a buying process. <laughs> really? And, and I, guess, I, I guess it's because if you find a 404 page in our website, which is hard to find, <laughs> then it actually correlates with you being closed one at a later point. That's so funny. Is it because people are just trying to find more information more actively? That's my hypothesis, at least, uh, that, you know, because the, you look at so many pages, at some point you're going to hit 404, and that's actually a good lead scoring model for you being close to, uh, yeah. you know, to a sales conversation. W what can you do with that kind of information? So first of all, you can look at, so for example, the about page, you make that a lot more trustful if you're a lot more prettier. Make sure the, the integration page is constantly updated. It basically highlights the most important asset, content assets you have and the ones you sh should invest the most time in keeping stellar. And once you're satisfied with those pages, then you can move on to produce those pages that drive uh, new demand. So let's say your integration page hasn't been updated a year, but you've added five or 10 new integrations. By listing those on the integration page, you most likely will be able to close more revenue. Okay. But you, do you see the distinction between like the certain, the content that starts the journeys and then what you look at uh, yeah. when, when you buy? 
Is there anything else that you learned um, as in pages you thought would drive a lot of revenue, but maybe didn't? Yeah, there's typically a big mismatch between the ones. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, so we have a bot bounty program on our website. So people would be Googling for finding a bot bounty program. And if I were just to look at the conversions that this page has, it actually converts quite nice, but it's because it's irrelevant people to our business who are just, you know, looking for bot bounty programs and then converting. So in, in, in an MQL world, they look great because it's a sign up to the product or like a booking a demo call, but they're never ever present, you know, when you look at sales qualified or uh, one yeah. deals. So you want to look at it from both angles. Where do people start journeys from? And do they actually progress down through the sales funnel? And if they only, you know, convert to a very early stage, well, then you probably don't want to spend a lot of co uh, content resources on con continuing to produce content like this. Oh, that's a very interesting point. And it's so important to look at this because I think that, especially in SEO, and this is something I'm always saying, we're looking at KPIs that don't paint the whole picture. So many yeah. people tell SEOs, uh, we want traffic, grow traffic, grow brand awareness, yeah. and grow rankings. And yeah, brand awareness is very important. It's, it's really good to have that, a recognizable brand when you get into the conversation. But if you're only looking at those KPIs, it changes the way that you're creating the content. And it changes the kind of content that you choose because- Exactly. Yeah, you don't know what the end result is going to be, and you might not even care if that's not your KPI. Yeah, exactly. And I think maybe uh, I think I would say a fair way to look at it would be maybe of those, if you produce content that converts a lot, you need to apply like a quality measure for that at least. The emails that we do collect from this organic piece, do they somewhat fit the ideal customer profile that we are trying to attract with these? And if all of them are like private emails or like never ever becoming demo calls or deals, et cetera, then it's not the content you want to like, yeah. you know, the salespeople would get pissed off if you tell them to keep, keep calling these guys. Do you, what do you do with that content then? If you're just getting a bunch, I mean, do you <laughs> get rid of it? Mm, yeah. You're probably more the expert here, maybe of, of uh, whether you should do it or, <laughs> or not, but you can say, in some sense, it doesn't hurt, you know, it gets you brand awareness if you want, but it does fill your retargeting cookies with low quality stuff that you then pay to retarget. Yeah. So maybe you want to exclude this one from your retargeting audience, not to waste money on people who are clearly not looking to, to buy something that you do. Yeah. Um, is there... So this, this is a good place, I think, to, to close off our conversation, <laughs> but I just want to have one more, <laughs> uh, one more question yeah. is like, I'm sure, I'm sure that in your space in attribution with everything that's going on on LinkedIn right now, you probably want to like shake some people and say, listen, yeah. it's not like that. <laughs> so if you could just get them to understand something, I, uh, what would you want them to understand? Uh, I guess we, uh, we tried at, on our blog. We, uh, we, we, I, we a huge respect to the Refine Labs guys and they put up a lot of great content, but we, we tried the, what they say about self-reported attribution and we ran it for a hundred book demo calls. And our conclusions was that one, first of all, a good self-reported answer is a bit of a, a unicorn. <laughs> People don't fill in directional, like long form writing yeah. into those fields. That, that's one problem. So you need a lot of conversions to, you know, get any direction out of it. Um, secondly, people don't understand how they got into your funnel or they don't remember yeah. So we, we took those conversions when we compared the self-reported answer to what it says in dream data. And it would be people who had been part of, you know, who've been on our website a lot of times before they converted. So they didn't recall what was actually the first real first touch compared to what yeah. they, 
of course it it means like if you write podcast or content or something like that it means that a certain piece of content made a big impression but it was actually not how we got funneled into uh, into your customer journey and then i think that the what you know uh, i was mostly disappointed about this kind of self reported attribution was that it's not directional it's not you know it's how do you make cost decisions about somebody who writes mm -hmm. reports google well was it a google ad uh, was it organic uh, yeah which campaign was it uh, <laughs> etc but it's not to say i think it's a, in e and and you should do both situations so you know quantitative analysis gives you something and then qualitative gives you something else yeah and like at the end of the day we're not trying to say we do magic <laughs> we're just trying to say we'll take all the information that you have first party collected inside of your company and we'll make it available for you we're not saying it's 100% yeah. of everything that's going on it's not the whole picture but it's at least making the information available that you do have available and that will make it easier for you to trust your gut feeling come up yeah. with ideas of what you should do more of and and less of Excellent. Well, Stefan, thank you so much. If people want to connect with you, um, I mean, I want to say LinkedIn is probably the best place, but is there anywhere else? Stefan? Can you hear me? <laughs> oh, I lost you. But I'm just gonna, can you hear me? Well, I'm just going to go ahead and say thanks, everybody, for listening. I recommend you follow Stefan on LinkedIn, connect with him, and you learn more about attribution and dream data. And uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Stefan. He's still here. He just lost his mic for a sec. <laughs> and that's the end of the podcast right there. Hope you enjoyed the episode. But please don't go just yet. If you did enjoy this episode, please leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It'll help other people like you discover us and get the same insights, and it would really help us out a lot. Um, thank you for being a loyal flying cat and for listening. See you next time.